Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be tuning in from. Welcome to the Open Web Forum at COGEX, curated by Fabric Ventures on this glorious sunny day in London. As a very distracting thing flies by, but I don't know about you viewers, it's starting to really feel like summer over here. I'm Ian, I'll be your MC for the day. I'm really excited to walk you through our stage because it's a topic I'm genuinely passionate about, and we have some incredible speakers lined up tackling all of the most pressing topics within the Open Web. So a quick run through today's agenda. First up, we'll have, in about five minutes, the opening keynote speech from Fiber Ventures' very own managing partner, Richard Muirhead, to introduce us to the new paradigm of the open economy. Then at 11, after we've had a few minutes to recover from having our perceptions of reality entirely shattered, we'll come to what I think we can all agree is a topic we've been very cognizant of over the last year and a half, that's healthcare. In particular, our panel will explore the question, who owns your data? And you know where your private critical data is stored, or more importantly, who actually has access to it. Now, the other defining issue of our time right now is sustainability. And at 12, we'll explore the open web innovations that can assist the world in addressing this global problem. After lunch, the afternoon opens with two back-to-backs on the data economy. Now, the most successful business model of the internet so far has been to harvest as much data as possible and only share it if profit can be extracted. So let us consider a new model where all participants are aligned in their incentives to maximize benefit for the system as a whole. At four, we'll step back to the macro context of crypto investing. When volatility is the norm and meme culture inspired coins are making teenage millionaires, what are the fundamentals and metrics we should be using when actually investing in crypto? And finally, rounding out the day, we have two packed panels on decentralized finance. Firstly, at five, the risks it poses to sovereign monetary policy. We have this new power given to individuals and protocols to control their assets and economic parameters, and that threatens the influence of central banks. And then at six, we'll explore its use cases beyond arbitrage and trading, how we have replicated the instruments of traditional finance and even creating entirely new ones. But without any further ado, please put your virtual hands together for the brilliant, visionary, and very well-dressed Richard Muirhead. Thank you so much, Ian. Um, I trust I'm audible. Um, great intro, uh, as ever. Um, so this is an amazing setup we've got here, like, you know, the second kind of uh, hybrid event that COGEX has put together. I'm on one of the floors here, quite high up at the um, Aga Khan Center here in, in King's Cross, and it is a truly beautiful day. So um, I'm privileged to be able to have the opportunity to talk to you uh, just for a little bit this morning about uh, the topic, um, the paradigm of the open economy. Um, I think um, it's become conventional wisdom now that the the platforms, the digital platforms upon which we have become to rely for our everyday lives, um, it, as a result of, you could argue, being kind of turbocharged um, by rentier capitalism, have um, had various unintended consequences. They concentrate wealth. Um, they perhaps impact our mental health. Uh, they perhaps uh, lead to outcomes in uh, terms of politics that we don't necessarily uh, desire. Um, and the answer to that, we believe, actually is not less capitalism. It's actually kind of more capitalism, but more evenly spread, um, more equitable in its nature. And the secret to that is the concept of digital ownership, uh, actually being able to replicate that um, sense of belonging and participation and stake um, that you get in the physical world properly in the, uh, the digital world. And it builds upon the principle that uh, there is virtue, in fact, uh, in selfishness. Um, and this is a fundamental aspect of society. It's fundamental to uh, well-functioning families. Um, and we think through a set of technologies that, te um, that are now uh, come uh, to pass, that this uh, can be fundamental and drive a very positive change in, in business. But one of the questions that people, or two questions that people are trying to address right now is, are we now seeing the kind of first sort of green shoots of actual mass adoption of these technologies in this new um, economy? Or is this just something that is going to succumb to a mass mania, uh, tulip-like in its, in its nature? And so we're going to dig a, a little bit more into that. Uh, but before we do that, stepping back a little bit, um, I think we all have, can make the observation that there is more data uh, around today than there has ever been before. And we will expand on this. It's more widely spread. Uh, arguably, it's of greater value. It's better structured. Um, and 
also think it's well understood that network effects, and in particular data network effects, where you know each additional uh, node on the network, each additional set of data contributed, increases the value of all of the other nodes uh, individually and all of the other sets of data. Um, and empirically, you know, network effects um, have been shown to deliver um, most uh, extraordinary returns from a venture capital perspective. It's perhaps the most valuable weapon in the toolkit of an entrepreneur um, and uh, arguably has delivered a lot of value to society, uh, perhaps as mentioned with some unintended uh, consequences. So many of the greatest challenges and opportunities for humankind out there are ones that we might want to address using these data network effects. However, whenever I'm looking to do that, um, you start with an empty room as an entrepreneur, as anybody setting out to do this. And when you, and actually I'm in, as it strikes me, in a pretty much empty room. Um, uh, but you're, it, and you, you face the challenge of that cold start on that cold morning. How do you get the system cranking, the network mo moving? A single fax machine with nobody to fax is not much value. Showing my age there, perhaps single email address is not that, that much value. Um, you know, a market with no goods, no liquidity in it is not that much value. With no buyers and sellers, it's not not much value. And even if you have early adopters, visionaries who are highly motivated and informed to try and address a particular problem, you know, in, in whatever sector it might be, um, this is this nut is one of the key things that entrepreneurs seek to try and crack to launch Airbnb or launch eBay or start collecting health data um, where even in the face of the pandemic, we have challenges in trying to do that properly. So that's one big challenge. The second challenge we've seen with some of these, you know, pervasive digital platforms that we're very familiar with, and we're obviously familiar with this, this particular character, um, comes down to the old adage, follow the money. If you, um, if you look at this system, it's ad driven by and large. It's not just us, but it's kind of our data that is the product in that system. And by the way, I'm absolutely of, do not believe that any of the individuals here um, are nefarious in, in their activity. I don't believe there's any conspiracy going on. It's just how the system is architected and it's very powerful. And despite the protestations of um, the likes of Google that they will not be evil, uh, that is perhaps not quite enough anymore. There are, uh, your, your data is in jeopardy. Um, leaks go, you know, just recently as in April, I think it was another half a, a billion users data leaked from, um, uh, from Facebook. Um, and it leads to some of these unintended consequences I was <clears throat> mentioning. It's optimized to drive consumerism and, and purchasing. It's optimized perhaps to make you buy the pieces of plastic that are produced at low cost that end up in the ocean that we do not need. Um, it's a perfect platform for political ma manipulation. The infinite scroll is uh, not useful, I think, to any of us. Um, and I think that it does put excessive power in the hands of very few uh, individuals, arguably of a, of a certain uh, type. And I think um, this is a situation that most people would um, argue um, cannot persist. There's a third problem that we see in these platforms, and that is that over time, they become so entrenched, so capable um, of retaining their users that they work so hard to attract in the first place, um, that they start to serve their own users, their own needs, and not those of the users themselves. They are incentivized occasionally to share their data and open up to third parties. But you, know, you can go back to 2014 with ESPN and Netflix or 2018 <clears throat> uh, with LinkedIn and Facebook and, and, and Twitter over this past decade as well. And all of these different players have closed down by and large the data access, the, the, the APIs, the application programming inf interfaces as they're called, upon which third party developers rely as soon as they see the promise of the applications that are built. And of course, this supports, along with acquisitions, their dominance, their hegemony. But what it does also is it stifles innovation in the name of, of the user. Um, and I think that is perhaps of all of these three issues, the greatest one. 
because it means we're lis- missing a lot of opportunity um, to, del- to deliver value um, as the world continues to change and move forward. Um, and so that rug pulling that they do on their partners is, is a major challenge. Um, so, oops, is it gone? Here we go. Build going on. So um, we think that the new stack that has been produced, um, uh, let's call it the open stack, the set of technologies, can make a fundamental difference here. Um, it's it's actually, uh, unless one is living in this space, it is quite remarkable the depth of innovation that has taken place at every single layer. It starts down with um, the, the computing layer itself. It's um, we have gone through a shift from cloud computing, as remarkable as it is, which in many respects you can think of as uh, borrowing some pieces of um, a few spare servers in Jeff Bezos's network uh, basement, but through to um, you know truly decentralized computing, where there are uh, nodes around the world that are sufficiently uh, distributed and decentralized in their control that are delivering on storage, de- delivering on compute, delivering on encoding um, and decoding and encryption and so forth in a truly decentralized manner. We're still at the early stages of that, but it's remarkable what is being achieved under our noses, and we'll expand a little bit more on that as well. On top of that, we've gone a sh- from uh, a- through a shift from these closed data networks um, architected and optimized to harvest and trap that data as we were discussing. Um, um, An example would be, of course, Facebook, um, to an open value network like Ethereum um, that is built to uh, not just handle data, but through this notion of digital ownership, digital scarcity, um, reflect individuals' identities, reflect the value of their data. In fact, we also reflect other types of value in terms of in, in different forms of digital uh, asset that are native to the applications that are being built in, in that environment. And that shift is a fundamental one. It's a shift to an intermeshing of, of, of networks that where those um, those assets, those uh, capabilities can kind of freely move around from something that was uh, siloed and constrained. On top of that, we're shifting from um, a very uh, monolithic a brittle approach to building applications in many enterprises um, might be opened a little bit. You know, Transport for London does a great job with some of its uh, open data initiatives, for example. Um, but fundamentally, is hard to change rapidly, and is controlled by one organization and is limited to to a setup where um, we can attain the dream of having reusable building blocks of software. That behind which not they're not just like the blueprint for building software, but they're live running pieces of software with data behind them. Whether it be the data on the traffic in in uh, in, in London, or whether it be a credit score and so forth, and that's a major step forward. Uh, on top of that, if that weren't enough, we've got a new business model, so we can shift from uh, this rentier approach, this profit maximizing approach uh, to to business. Uh, to one through the notion of of digital ownership where um, you can actually uh, drive a different sense of belonging, participation in these networks um, and uh, shift from Patreon, which is fantastic for the creator economy, uh, fantastic for allowing people to um, support their artistic endeavors and find their tribe somewhere around the world, um, to one where there can be this a direct reward, this direct ownership to fans who p- particularly were involved, say, in the creation of a uh, new YouTube community, or a, it could relate to fans of a new fringe theater. There are lots of ways it can be applied, but um, it opens up all, all sorts of new opportunities, and we'll work uh, look a little bit more of that as well. And then on top of that, with that great power comes great responsibility to be able to um, uh, actually uh, yeah, just adjusting my screen here a little bit. To, to great responsibility to be actually govern these things properly, and but the good news is that if we contrast, for example, um, Epic and and um, uh, and Fortnite, for example, with um, Axie, which is a very interesting game in a metaverse that is owned by its users, it's also governed by its users, and there are tools like Aragon, for example, being used to build and codify 
models of decentralized governance that are incorruptible. And so when you roll out this new set of technologies and it has the positive impact we believe it can, that can be maintained over time. So another whole layer uh, of innovation. And this is what we view as the, the, the stack that enables this shift from the closed economy <clears throat> through to the open economy. Um, so with that stack, how do we address those specific problems that I spoke about? Well, so the first one with this question of the um, empty room. Um, and, you know, I think there's already been, uh, first to note, um, there is incredible um, growth in data. Uh, if you look at those uh, dots there, well, one is a dot and one looks like um, Jupiter or Saturn or something. Um, you know, the first is the amount of data created through to a point um, about a, a decade or two ago. And then the, the second one um, is actually the amount of data created just last year. Um, so, you know, first one in all of humanity, second one just last year. The rate of growth is simply fantastic. And there's already been, and I think we can look here at the sequence um, of developments through the history of computing, in particular how data was handled. And we can see um, how there were efforts pr primarily to control and harness data from a top-down perspective. But over the last couple of decades, we've seen really powerful examples of how you can harness emergent behavior in networks from users through transparency, through accountability to drive really interesting behavior where they self-organize from the bottom up. And that, that allows us to shift from kind of user-generated content, which has already been powerful in um, producing the results in Wikipedia and Facebook, even in TikTok, through to user-owned content, which is going to be yet more uh, powerful. And so we, we have seen that that ability is something that really helps us address the empty room problem. Um, the, if we go to the second problem, this problem of rentier capitalism, the pro problem of the ad-driven you know, revenue model, um, as described in the introduction, we think, and, in, and as described in the, in the stack itself, we think that if we can shift from uh, the profit motive for third-party shareholders to uh, a situation where there is ownership for all stakeholders within a network, that that you know, sense of uh, you know, belonging can drive extreme forms of cooperation. You know, that, that belonging, that coordination is essential to a well-functioning family, city. Uh, we think now increasingly can be for corporations. Um, as kind of illustrated, I guess, by the GIF here, it's also essential for the smooth functioning of a kitchen. People have to take responsibility. They have to be incentivized to do that. One part of that is to avoid getting a dressing down from uh, Gordon Ramsay. So you have to have some stake in it. There is a kind of a stick side of things uh, that is necessary. And that can be achieved now with the technologies that are part of the open economy. Another critical part um, is that you feel in a very positive sense, you belong to this team that's going to achieve incredible things. Um, through the shared vision of a racing team, uh, ownership, look at all the uniforms here, and through financial incentives and a share on the upside, you can, you can achieve that very delicate and precise coordination of an incredibly uh, fast uh, pit stop. That's the kind of coordination that can be done through um, the digital assets that are native to these networks. Now, these things can get out of control. If you believe too much um, and you only believe and you're not sure if there's actually substance behind that um, and you uh, exist within these markets which are indeed intrinsically um, suited for speculation, you can um, uh, have situations like Do Dogecoin. And I'm not advocating for those kind of vacuous uh, missions and I'm not necessarily adv advocating for the way Elon Musk um, is cavalier about some of these mar markets. Um, but nonetheless, I think we can move away from uh, you know, the current setup with the concentration of pro profits to the few and the unintended consequences to something that is much more inclusive and equitable. So on the third side, so when the web first you know, blanketed the planet you know, 20 years ago, more or less, it was really built uh, for you know, consumption, for reading by uh, you know, users, by individuals, by people. And they, but the technologies at the time were quick uh, to dream of a world where actually those pieces of software um, could actually talk to each other. 
and this was kind of dubbed by Tim Berners-Lee, the inventor of the original web, the semantic web. Um, and you know, the reason that was thought to be powerful is, is not uh, to do with um, taking out a, a middleman in that interaction, which is somehow sometimes how uh, the, the world of um, the open economy or, or blockchain is, 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 is viewed. It's about the fact that if you can allow um, these different um, running pieces of software to be composed, to be choreographed um, arbitrarily, that provides for you know intense level of innovation. It can trigger, in fact, a tsunami of innovation of the, the use and reuse of these components for different purposes. So an example might be if you, um, uh, rather than the current situation where you take a lift in uh, perhaps to this location in an Uber and the driver um, works hard over many years in order to build up their reputation uh, within that particular platform. And yes, they don't necessarily own their data and don't have an ability to be able to move it. That's an important thing that can be addressed. But more importantly than that, it is possible that it, they could reuse that data within maybe Lyft itself as a, an alternative service. And even beyond that, it's possible that some other application developer who comes along and wants to tap into the services of that driver and wants to find the one with the reputation and the availability right now all on an anonymous basis can build a new application around that live running data service or web service. So that's the potential for innovation that we are particularly excited about. So bringing it kind of all together, um, all of these projects start with, and this is kind of the model that has sprung up in, in this environment, with a team and an idea and an idea for marketing it. Often in this um, environment, it's called, uh, it's actually a meme. Uh, they build uh, some fundamental piece of technology. Uh, yes, fundamental piece of technology, or at least a great piece of technology is what we, what we uh, at least at Fabric, tend to be looking for, not just the meme. Um, and then on top of that, they uh, we add, um, an investor with some some capital and some connections. Um, on top of that, um, there's some uh, perhaps the token is made uh, f freely tradable, so it can get into the hands of lots of stakeholders within the, within this broad network, including the ones that are going to run the nodes on the network, and be rewarded in those tokens for that activity. And that could well be, and is now being increasingly extended to. Um, the application developers who are building things on those uh, platforms, so they are also uh, rewarded, perhaps and hopefully safe in the knowledge they're not going to have access to the data from that platform and other platforms, you know, rug pulled away from them. And that um, in turn drives users and liquidity of, of content, um, of capital liquidity itself in those environments, and that feeds back to the founders. Uh, rewarding them for the effort they're put, they're put in um, to f for further development of the fundamental technology. Um, and all of these stakeholders could be involved in the governance. And then, of course, goes back to the financial backers as well, who will also be involved in very interesting ways in the governance of these new systems. And that really is a potent mix of many different intermeshing <clears throat> network effects um, that can address uh, a whole raft of new different uh, applications that were previously just simply unaddressable, even though people could conceive of them. And the way we look at this in terms of the long view is that this is a, um, a, a refinement of the technology that is uh, capitalism. Uh, you know, you have to remember that if, if you take the long view, that capitalism itself, you know, perhaps can be marked with the uh, the book written by Luca Pacioli about uh, double entry bookkeeping, very sexy topic, um, 500 years ago. And, you know, and then uh, there have been various developments uh, to it in terms of making it more efficient to produce goods and to move goods, and then uh, making it more efficient to coordinate those uh, supply chains. And through this whole period, um, the demise of capitalism has been uh, predicted, um, uh, whether it be by, by Marx when he understood his, the potency of it, or whether it by Schumpeter when he spoke of the gale of creative uh, destruction that is inherent to, to capitalism itself. But we think now as we move into this next phase, when we've seen that we can efficiently uh, produce digital goods and we can officially transfer them, but we can now efficiently coordinate um, digital activity that we can kind of course correct on capitalism and come up with something that is more cooperative, um, uh, more mutual in its benefit, um, and uh, more benevolent in, it, in its nature. And perhaps not uh, before 
at time because of the, the vast degree of inequality that has arisen um, over the last decades. Uh, you know, uh, one statistic is that the top 1% in the U.S. is is, is uh, uh, many tri tens of trillions richer, and the bottom 50% of the United States is um, half a billion poorer. Um, and so this is not something that we want to allow to persist. I think it's uh, deeply dangerous. Um, and we have to remember that uh, the way we design the economic systems um, the, upon which we, we fundamentally rely is a choice. It's not physics. They're not axioms sort of handed down by uh, the universe. We can construct them. And that um, actually it's not all about capital and economics. It's about people um, that actually the most, uh, even though there's a virtue and selfishness, it's by way of the re reciprocity that you're looking to drive in your activities. And that ultimately um, we may defend competition in markets, but really what we want to try and enhance is cooperation. So we think this is not a small step that we can possibly take together here. Um, and we think because of this, the potency of that, we think because of the, um, uh, the ability, the pace of innovation that's possible through the combinations of these different elements of this stack, that we're already seeing this spreading across many different sectors. You have the open web with the core infrastructure layers, some of which we've been talking about and you'll be very familiar with. Open finance is uh, taking out, off the combination of decentralized finance and uh, open banking and, and so on and so forth. And then open media, this shift from user-generated content, as powerful as that is, to, to ownership of that content and perhaps ownership of the relationship between the audience and the fans um, and the sports people or the, or the musicians or the, or the, or the artists. Um, and then open healthcare, the ability uh, to be comfortable sharing increasing amounts of your data. I fumbled through my NHS apps as I came in um, um, to the door just here this morning. I think you know we need to become more fluent in that and more comfortable with that. And I think collectively we can contribute our data to solving many fundamental problems in many uh, parts of the health life cycle and many you know areas of disease. And then what we call either open learning and earning or open work. This notion uh, that I think we've also seen in the last 18 months of the pandemic that our identities, our digital identities uh, with respect to our learning and, and, and our class curriculum vitae are in incre increasingly captured um, uh, at the moment by LinkedIn or at the moment maybe in some notes in Google Classroom. And I was inspired in, in, in the last sort of year or so when I heard that Microsoft had actually started looking at a form of decentralized identity that was built natively to the Bitcoin blockchain as being viewed as the most sort of uh, immutable one out there. Um, and, uh, and, I, and I think that's key because the future is surely is going to be one where um, from you know, the nursery to the nursing home, we are vesting into some digital profile, all of that information about who we are and about what job we should have next. And that we'll be able to take that codified representation and match it to you know, deep job markets and automatically be, be matched to great opportunities. And that will change fundamentally our relationship with who we're employed by, how we're paid by them, and perhaps how we're supported by the nation states within which we, uh, we live. So, so we think that, um, you know, the open economy is kind of uh, is, is nigh upon us um, and that uh, that it's a, a great step forward. And I'm not going to go through all of these explanations, but I will share <laughs> the deck um, afterwards. It'll be freely available and I'd be happy to continue the debate with anybody who would choose to do so. Um, so sometimes um, uh, particularly well in this area, there are a lot of naysayers who talk about um, the fact that you know where are the users, where are the where are the use cases, what actually is is going on here, and so we've got a couple of slides here to point to some of the traction that we're seeing. So um, the new infrastructure upon which this is being built, and we referred to it earlier, that shift from cloud computing to decentralized computing, is uh, you know the pace of innovation continues at an intense rate. Um, it was it is incredible to note that back in 2013 that the computing power um, of you know the Bitcoin blockchain exceeded that of the top 500 uh, supercomputers in the world. Now it's not an exactly perfect comparison, but it is definitely of, of note. And you can see from the graph things have only you know leapt forward stratospherically since then. And there's been developments 
um, in terms of the scaling. Um, we've, there's been the developments of Ethereum, the ability to have a general purpose Turing complete um, blockchain for smart contract execution. There's been a developments in how to interconnect all of these blockchains and they've been going live uh, just re recently. So that is really, I think, um, we've seen incredible progress in 10 years and we're just uh, beginning. I think the second area, if we take open uh, finance, um, the graph on this here, this diagram here, is the value locked into decentralized finance, which has leapt up to you know close to a hundred billion, and really accelerated just in the last couple of years. And um, you know, you could argue you start with Bitcoin, uh, with uh, perhaps some value as um, a store of value, uh, increasingly good one, arguably of that nature. Uh, but there's been incredible innovation since around how to deal with volatility with stable coins, um, how to, to ensure against the technical risk within smart contracts, you know, uh, uh, Nexus Mutual, uh, for example. Um, and uh, I think that, you know, we've, we, people miss the, uh, the compounding effect of those innovations um, and miss now how we're starting to marry this uh, digital decentralized finance world with real world productive assets and activities. And a good example of that will be one of our portfolio companies, Centrifuge. Um, if we then take open media, uh, we were fortunate enough to be uh, connected with the team at Decentraland when they first created that, that uh, you know, digitally scarce metaverse that they've been building. And when they worked on the Ethereum standard for non-fungible uh, tokens, um, and they're joint authors of that. Um, and we we saw the incredible adoption and the degree to which CryptoKitties perhaps uh, somewhat brought the Ethereum blockchain uh, to a standstill. Um, and I think now um, uh, we're we've looked at an amazement of the progress of our portfolio company, um, so rare in creating these digital representations of, of football cards and starting to innovate furiously about the whole way in which sports are licensed, um, and uh, by connecting them to uh, various games that people can use them in. So when you add to that, I think the, the recent fervor about art, and I think it will be more about music, um, there's, I think, incredible evidence of real traction and sales going on, and that's what this graph shows us. And so taken all uh, together, um, we've, you know, it may be down at 1.6 trillion at the moment. There is incredible value captured in the very core of what you could argue is the open economy and the very ex many examples outside of Bitcoin or Ethereum of very substantially valuable companies, uh, you know, as you can see listed on this slide. Um, a couple more stats. So Axie mentioned before um, is, is a game um, uh, that you uh, are able to breed your axes, um, but it's one critically where you are able to own a stake in that environment. And there's a remarkable fact that uh, people who are borrowing in order to um, uh, have a stake in that environment and play to earn are earning three times as much as they were earning historically prior to losing their job in the pandemic over in the, the Philippines. That's, I think, pretty interesting example of the potential of these environments. So Rare mentioned already, um, I think we're even conservatively saying has gone up 50x in revenue uh, in, a, in a year, showing what can happen when you give people ownership of the platform and a direct relationship with the sports fans that they love. Um, we've got here uh, the example of Aave, which are all encompassing, probably you could talk about about 20 billion being locked up um, there in terms of uh, loans. Um, if you think about funding circle, that's about 4 billion um, in loans. It's, it's scaled 25% in the last year. Uh, Aave has scaled 14x on a larger base in the last year. There, are, there is real adoption, something really afoot here. And if you look at the fundamental measure of, of Ethereum and the nodes on it, the addresses on it, uh, we're at now something that is steadily climbing up, you know, hundreds of millions of Ethereum addresses. But, you know, this is still a small fraction of the number of IP addresses internet or, or, or internet users out there. So you could argue we're still very much at the beginning. Um, and then if you look at Bitcoin, the level of trading activity with Bitcoin um, on some days is, is, is exceeding that of U.S. equities. Uh, not a direct comparison, uh, but again, I think a very powerful indication um, of uh, adoption. And the incredible thing is that we have got many of the individuals um, 
that are the, the prime movers, the core contributors, the founders behind these projects with us today. At the end of um, uh, today and of the next three days, uh, at, at the end of Wednesday, we'll have uh, Vitalik, uh, who Buterin, who doesn't probably need much introduction to many of you, uh, but wrote the white paper for Ethereum. Uh, we'll have Dr. Stephen Waterhouse, also known as Seven, uh, a collaborator of ours at Fabric Ventures, um, behind Orchid, Eli from, uh, from Starkware, um, uh, Stanny from Aave, Kane from Synthetics, um, and, and team from team players from so rare and so on. I could, I could go on, but you can read the agenda. So thrilled that we've been able to pull this together and thrilled, um, that I think that, uh, this is not just about, uh, new, new toys, although they often start toy like. It's not just about new technology startups, but it's actually about something that can really fix some fundamental problems in society today and allow us to grasp some new opportunities. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Richard. I mean, I get to chat with you every day, but you know, it's still great to hear you lay everything out so concisely and so clearly like that. And I think it might just be a touch biased, but that thesis is probably something we can all get behind solving the world's greatest problems through collaboration and through efficient use of data. It's actually so motivating every day to see the traction we have so far. And remember that actually we're still so early in this space. But Everyone just sit tight because in 19 minutes now, coming at 11, we're going to have our first panel, which is healthcare, who owns my data? Do you know where your private critical data is stored or who has access to it? It's going to be moderated by Baron James O'Shaughnessy. He was previously parliamentary undersecretary of state for the Department of Health and Social Care and is now working with some great health tech startups. We'll be back in 19 minutes for that. So go make a cup of tea, stretch your legs and see you soon.